I'd like to introduce somebody who is a great friend of the Planet Forward Project and has been working with our students and as our, part, uh, as our uh, coordinator for global partnerships has helped bring the college consortiums and many of you guys here together today. She's a former Undersecretary of State for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs. She's a former journalist herself, and she's going to lead this conversation about climate makes it worse on issues like gender and poverty. Tara Sonnenschein. Tara? <laughs> All yours. How's everybody feeling after this wonderful morning? Oh, a little louder. So I want to begin by um, thanking Frank and this incredible Planet Forward team. I think they deserve a round of applause. What do you think? In just a minute, I'm going to bring out an incredible uh, panel that you have information about each. So my intros will be short. But I thought I would start by saying that I am passionate about women and girls. And I wonder if anyone else out there feels passionate about women and girls. We are half the sky, as Nicholas Kristof said. And what I've learned from the Institute of Peace, from media, and from the State Department is that if you have women at the table, a lot more can happen. And today's panel is really the connection of women, climate, and food. And I will begin by telling you two things. First of all, wars happen over food and water. It drives conflict. But you know what? Peace happens also around a table where people gather and talk about what animates their cultures and their lives. And often that is food. But there is a fact that I want to introduce our panel and have them talk about, and this is the fact. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization, the FAO, if we could close the gap between men and women in the agricultural sector, women who are disproportionately affected by conflict, climate, food insecurity, scarcity, if we could unlock their power to be involved in decision-making, business, agriculture, and policy, if we could close that gap between men and women, we will feed 100 to 150 million more people. Is that worth a shot? I think so. So with that, I'm going to introduce our panel. And we have two wonderful GW professors coming out, and I want you to welcome them and applaud them. One is Ram Fishman, our economist and researcher, and Imani Cheers, who is an expert on gender and Africa. <laughs> and they are our faculty reps on this panel. And then we have two very special guests. We have a student, and I think you met Eva uh, Moss this morning very briefly, but she is with us to talk more about women and girls. And then we have a special treat. We have a man who owns a forest. First, Eva, come on out. And then I want to bring out a man who is the owner of his own forest. Would you welcome Avi Ram Rosen? So I'm going to do a quick tour of the world on food, women, and climate. And I'm going to start in a country called Ecuador. Anyone been to Ecuador? Wow. Where else could you get college students who all raise their hand that they've been to Ecuador? Ram has some cutting edge new research, fresh, hot off the press, about what's happening with climate and women in Ecuador. Tell us. So I guess because I'm the economist, then I'm in charge of bad news today. <laughs> but, oh, yes. But you also do sometimes bring good news. Yeah, I'm trying to, yeah. So uh, you know, there's, there's um, growing, a growing body of evidence now that um, finds, that suggests that climate change is going to have 
a host of negative outcomes and will disproportionately affect women, especially in developing countries. For example, we know now that um, when, when, when there's a drought or when temperatures are high, yields decline, incomes drop, there's more crime, there's more conflict. And you know, we also know independently that when things are bad, when um, in early stages of one's life, um, either in utero or as an infant, then the implication of that are very long term. So that made us wonder if there might be a long term impact of high temperatures um, when you're in utero or as an infant. Wow. And um, we had access to this large uh, data set in Ecuador with my colleague Paul Carrillo and Jason Russ, the graduate students at the Department of Economics, and we just checked whether there is a correlation between you know, unusual heat exposure, high temperatures at the time of birth, and especially in utero, and the adult outcomes of, of both men and women, especially their earnings, because their earnings, their income as adults, reflects in, in many ways their well-being, their health, their cognitive ability, and so forth. So does productivity actually go down in heat? Yes, we found it doesn't only go down in heat. That's something that we've known already. But what we're finding now is, shockingly, that a woman that was born during a time that the temperatures were abnormally hot in her place of birth as an adult will tend to earn less. By every increase of one degree centigrade, the, the incomes drop by one to two percent. And it's a very statistically robust finding, and it's very alarming. If you think of, you may think that one percent decline in income is not that much, but it is actually a huge amount because that's a loss that's incurred year after year by a very large number of women. So if you think about temperatures changing, you know, um, and we did this research in Ecuador, but you know, hopefully future research will try to uncover similar patterns in other countries, then that means a very long-term, very large decline in income for that country. What other repercussions are there beyond just income if you have people living in real heat and they're already disadvantaged, what else, what other things could play out over time? So research points out again and again that when there is a drought or when it's hot, then the poor suffer the most, especially women. And that may mean um, when, there is a, when there is a shortfall in income, what we call an income shock in economics, then the poor have very limited ability to what we call to smooth that shock or to buffer themselves from that shock. They don't have access to any um, you know, financial services, credit. They often do not have access to insurance that can protect them from these shocks. So the implications of that can be very long term. And, um, you know, and then we see other more extreme social phenomena arise. Like in we, I've done some research with a colleague from NYU Abu Dhabi, David Blakesley, showing that when there is a drought or a heat wave in India, crime rates go up by five to six percent including there's other research showing especially crimes against women also increase. So when so there's no way to violence. buffer, yes, when there's you, no way to, to protect yourself from an income shock, um, then there are extreme implications, especially for the poor. Let's go to India and come to our panelists. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you and your wife end up with a forestation project in India. What's it called? What does its title mean? Okay, so uh, we started, uh, my wife, Yorit, and I started Sad in the Forest uh, in 2003. Uh, we just started on a piece of barren land of 70 acres, uh, which then didn't have a blade of grass on it, and uh, with a dream to make an uh, indigenous forest, a tropical dry evergreen forest. Um, and what happened was that volunteers started coming. People started coming and be interested in what we're doing. And slowly, we ended up as an organization. But we became an organization almost by default. It was not our, our intention. Our intention Take was just to, to, <laughs> to reforest the land. The, the name of the organization, Sadhana Forest, actually, Sadhana in Sanskrit means the focus on the truth. So the organization really tries to focus on the, on the main issues. Uh, we are a vegan organization, and we promote a uh, plant-based diet. Um, so we basically plant trees that produce food with local people around the world. 
we do that in India, in uh, Haiti, and in Kenya. And um, we train, uh, first provide training to people how to plant trees in those harsh conditions of aridity. Uh, we developed some uh, techniques of irrigation and planting that are supporting the growth of the trees. And then all our food producing indigenous trees. And then uh, we provide them with free seedlings, and which we plant with them around their homes. And the idea is that the forest grows in concentric circles from the hut, from the house. So uh, there's a house here, and we plant first a few trees. And if they take care well of the trees, a few more and a few more and a few more. And then you end up with a sort of forest. Then the forest of the neighbor grows, and it becomes a conservation project. So the approach is not to, to uh, plant huge spaces, which is difficult to protect against grazing, against uh, charcoal production, but to uh, plant trees around people's homes, private food forests. Avi Ram, tell us how climate change then is affecting um, the, the forests that you see and where women fit into this complex equation of women, food, and climate. Yeah, so our experience in Haiti and in Kenya has been that, you know, when we offered training to the community, the people who came were mainly women. Um, so, you know, it became empower, empowerment for women just, again, by default, because they are the ones who were taking interest in the training and actually serious about planting the trees and about taking care of them. So that's the experience in Ansapit in Southeast Haiti and also in Samburu in Kenya, the tribe that we work with. Mainly women come. There it's also very much related to climate change because, because of the drought, uh, the men have to um, venture into other uh, very uh, far grazing areas and the women stay alone. So what would they do alone? There's no food security as such near the home because the animals are far away. So an animal-based food security would be ideal. Uh, sorry, uh, plant-based uh, food security would be ideal because that they can do themselves. It doesn't need a lot of water. They can use the recycled water from the laundry, from their uh, um, you know, dishwashing for the trees, and uh, provide food for themselves. Eva, make this very personal. Um, you were telling me a story about your own mom and, and West Samoa, and it sometimes helps to think about, I think mothers are a great invention, um, and I, I think um, women sometimes don't have their stories told. They don't find the voice and the means for expressing how it is they live their daily lives. Tell me a little bit about your mom. Well, I was born in Auckland, New Zealand, and my mom is from Western Samoa. And growing up in the tropics, and by default of my mom's um, ethnicity, I grew up with you know really rich and diverse plates for dinner. And I, I came to love, you know, taro and yams and coconut and mango and all that great stuff that's associated with the South Pacific. But there, there, there's a harsh reality to the backside of that in that my mom's side of the family that lives out in Western Samoa does still live a very rural existence. Um, they live under fales, which essentially are um, a platform hut with thatch roofing, and they are horticulturalists. They cultivate the, the bulk of their subsistence right in their yards, um, and they rely on the wet and dry seasons. And recently, the wet and the dry seasons, well, the wet has not been so wet and the dry has not been so dry. So taro, taro cultivation, which is a huge staple in the diet, is running on low. And the women in the family are the ones who are mainly cultivating it. And since there's not enough taro, they rely more on what's at the grocery store or the market, which requires money. And that, you know, the husbands are the ones who typically work and there's just not enough money to feed large families and to send the kids to school. So it's a very hard system that is exasperated by the changing climate um, and obviously is important on a, global, on a global platform, but also to me at home because it is my family and yeah. So Imani, take us to Africa where you've worked and bring it home again to some women you've met who reflect both the challenges and the opportunities. There are some barriers for women yes. um, going out to tend land or to own land or to work um, their produce. What have you seen? 
Um, thank you. Well, I feel really, I don't know, everyone else has really amazing stories, but um, I'm a journalist, so I've spent a lot of time. Um, I looked up and realized it's been actually 20 years, almost to the day that we've made our first uh, trip to Johannesburg, and, and throughout the time I've been able to um, meet a number of, of women and a number of, of young girls, and they are the majority responsibility, like I'm sure I, my colleagues have seen in, in the areas that they've visited, that they are the majority of the providers for, for their food, for their families, as well as themselves, and as a result of varying um, issues, uh, coastal erosion, um, I studied a bit of that when I was in Zanzibar most recently, which is a small country off the coast of Tanzania. And um, it was just, it's really amazing how um, we were some people earlier this morning were talking about climate change with um, you know, glaciers melting and, and I'm a huge fan of the HBO series Vice. And um, they recently launched their third season and their first episode was looking at um, the result of Antarctica and glaciers melting and what that's gonna do to um, coastal erosion and consistently rising um, sea levels. So I, it's very interesting when I, I meet a number of these women who live, um, as I mentioned, primarily in these coastal regions and, and how the result of climate change is impacting how their entire communities and way of life are completely being shifted because they're traditionally, whether um, their husbands are and, and sons are fishermen, and they are more um, tilling the land, but now their land is, is being um, literally disappearing. Um, so the challenges that they face there, and then when you look at um, more inland, where, um, as I'm sure everyone, especially, it's, it's become a huge deal. We had some of our, uh, you know, farmers who spoke earlier this morning about you know, the drought in California. Well, that's very real to us in the United States, but you know, there's been massive droughts in, in, in parts of, of Eastern Africa that have been completely devastating and completely wiping out um, you know, large, large portions of, of countries. Is there a woman you've met who you'd um, hold up as an example um, in, in any part of your travels whose story you think would resonate um, yeah, it, a number of women. I know one in particular who we actually brought to the first Planet for was some Mary and Jenga, who's a scientist um, and, and an anthropologist who's working with um, with briquettes and, and finding ways in which um, women can use um, natural resources to make fire briquettes. Um, as many people know, um, First of all, you have to have food to be able to cook it. But once you do get some food and you can cook it, um, individuals, uh, women who do spend the majority of the time preparing the meals for their family, then you, know, you can spend literally upwards of you know, six, seven, eight hours preparing um, a meal. And as a result of a lot of the carbon monoxide, um, and they're also, you know, they're cooking indoors. Um, so if you can imagine an incredibly small space um, with a fire going in the middle of this incredibly small space and all of the, the type the of fumes toxicity. and the toxicities that are being released. And a lot of times there's a baby on their back <laughs> as they're trying to prepare everything and, and just the dangers around that. So, so Mary created um, and through a series of recyclable um, resources to make fire briquettes, which has been pretty amazing. And then I met another woman and her family in Malawi um, who was doing also very interesting things with, with sustainable farming and vertical farming. Uh, and they were growing kale. These are women who have looked for options. Right. And um, one of the options, if those of you who followed the um, solar cookeries yeah. uh, movement, was to help women find new technologies to use in their huts and homes that would be safer. And also the problem of domestic violence and rape as women Huge. would go out into the fields. I know there are a lot of yeah. questions and I see the time ticking. So let me invite students to raise your hands because you have your first opportunity with all this research and, and farms in India, questions. And I will look around and we will bring you a microphone. And until I actually, ah, there's one, ah, one over here in the blue shirt, two rows in. And uh, we will just ask you to identify yourself and direct your question to one of the panels. Sure, my name is uh, Alex. I am a student, a grad student in Syracuse, New York at SUNY ESF. And I have a question for uh, Aviram, I think, with the, uh, so where did you get the idea of the, I guess, uh, an edible forest garden. And uh, we're actually in Syracuse quite interested. We're trying to have a little forest garden of our own on campus. But so where does that idea come from? How did that happen? 
Um, the idea exists in the world. I mean, uh, people have their kitchen gardens and they grow food for themselves uh, in many places in the world, especially in temperate uh, climates. You would see that uh, often. Um, we were inspired by the permaculture movement, but um, also just observing the need of the community that we work with. Um, we like, you know, to plant trees. And when you look at the open spaces, government land, public land in Haiti, and you plant trees there, it's useless. You know, the trees would be cut as soon as they're big enough. You know, uh, uh, protecting them would uh, incur a huge expense and would not be possible. Uh, uh, so having a, a little uh, forest, a little food forest around the home, which you can protect yourself, which you can water yourself, is much more practical. So the, the, the need came from, or the idea was enforced by the people. And so it's not only a good thing, does it make economic sense to give you a good news opportunity here? <laughs> um, it can. It very much depends on the context. Um, but there definitely are, in, you know, I think we're recognizing now that there are a lot of opportunities to reduce environmental impact and to improve you know, the financial, the revenue stream from agriculture. Um, often we see excessive use of inputs, and that can mean excessive use of water, excessive use of nitrogen fertilizers, that both of these consume a great deal of energy, mm -hmm. excessive use of pesticides with a pollution and health impact. So there's a, you know, there's a huge potential for a win-win outcome where we do also reduce environmental impact, manage with diminishing resources, and increase income. But it's not that easy to realize those gains, especially in developing countries where these farmers we're talking about are living in a very challenging environment. And it's very hard to help them to achieve those gains. You know, it turns out that it's easier to go to the moon than to make these things happen in developing countries. Maybe we as a world are not taking that challenge as seriously as we should and devoting the kind of energy that we should, but the potential is there and, and we just have to keep working on realizing how to do that. Yeah, uh, to make this even more optimistic in a way, I would say that um, uh, we have 84% survival rate of the trees planted in Haiti. So 84% people, 84 of, the of the trees that we planted in Haiti are surviving. So people are taking this very seriously. Uh, and that's, for me, it's a very good sign. You know, when we had the audit of our tree survivor, I was dreading <laughs> because we didn't know, you know, but when now we know and it's very optimistic. Yeah. One way that you all tell these stories, I know film and video and economic numbers are hard sometimes to make real. Um, Eva, you've managed to go to New Hampshire and make some of this real. How did you do it? <laughs> Um, well, Avram and I have a mutual friend, Sophie, whose farm I woofed on through the Worldwide Opportunities on Organic Farms Network. And uh, surprisingly enough, there, was, there were a lot of female farmers there who were, you know, wel welcomed with open arms into the food system. And they were very inspiring. And I was like, well, how can I capture, capture this, this inspiration and this motivation? And how can I tell their stories in a way that one, expresses the good news that they're doing, but two, also kind of puts an edge on it and what do they need to go further? What, you know, how, how to reach broader audiences in a way that, that inspires people, but also pushes them to help the, these people move forward. So I started collecting stories and framing up um, questions for interviews and was inspired by Frank Sesno to start a blog. So I've, I've started collecting photos and collecting stories and along the way I've collected a lot of friends and it's been really rewarding. So this is a very inspiring group, and I could talk to them all day, but that would be standing in the way of food, which at some point is going to come in the form of lunch. Um, two quick wrap-ups that I wanted to share with you. Firstly, we hope to keep growing this consortium of schools, and that means getting the word out to people at other schools. So if you're having a good experience and have a good experience, I hope you will tell other students to push hard to have a Planet Forward opportunity on their campuses. Second is, um, we collaborate with a lot of organizations, and one that I collaborate with is called World Learning. They do a lot of experiments overseas, and they have asked me to announce that they have one slot for a digital fellow to travel this summer 
to India and South Africa, all expense paid, with a stipend of $700. I'm going to sign up. Um, and it is to work with telling stories um, about justice uh, overseas. So if that is something that interests some of you or one of you, come see me. I'll be in the bright red suit. And with that, I want to thank each and every one of you for the contributions and the work you do and turn it back over to Frank Cessna. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, Abhiram, I think you've uh, offered to uh, host some people um, in your operations as well. Absolutely. So why don't in you? India, Haiti, and Kenya. Okay, so tell, so India, Haiti, and Kenya people could go and help you reforest? Absolutely. Um, you're all welcome to join us, to join Sadna Forest. You could look at our website, sadnaforest.org, or uh, our Facebook page, and come and uh, intern with us or volunteer with us, whatever is relevant uh, where you are. And uh, we'll be happy to support your learning about the environment, about sustainability, about women issues. And you'll be at lunch. And I'll be at lunch. OK, so yeah, fine. And tomorrow. Room. And Ram, how are you doing? Any, any, any help offered? We, we could keep some students busy. I'm, I'm thinking we should do a project, research project on your work. Maybe some students can reforest yeah, and do some great. statistics in the evening. There we go. Well, and Ram Fishman is here on campus. <laughs> there we go, <laughs> on campus. All right, thanks. Huh? Class. You can, well, we'll do that later. Yeah, You'll be yeah, back. Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks to all of you.